Round of applause, welcome our guest speaker, Brian McClendon. many months, mostly at high schools and colleges, and actually one in grade school. I will modify the content of the talk for this audience. Um, and I am excited because I've come to visit Cerner before and learn about the uh, data science and research that you guys have been doing. Uh, what I'm planning to do today is describe uh, a little bit of my life history, how I got to where I ended up, and go through some of the machine learning activity that I saw at Google and also uh, oversaw at other data problems that are similar to Turner's, but in a different space. So with that, uh, I grew up in Kansas. I grew up in Lawrence. I uh, went to the all schooling there. I became very interested in computer graphics at an early age, which for me was like 15 or 17, because you know, the video games were just coming out at the time. I took uh, my Pac-Man and Missile Command and Asteroids very seriously and uh, competed in engineering and uh, lucky for me they you know I, I was able to actually work on projects that were going to be relevant in the future I uh, we had a project to build a CPU and uh, at the time this was pretty advanced you took you know very small scale or, uh, MSI chips and you wired them together you had to design microcode and what was important about it though was that it was a group project and now many of you know that uh, to get things done it's very hard to do it on your own you need to split up the work, you need to have teams, you need to allocate those work across teams, but you know, when you're a kid coming up, you don't know that. Um, and so doing this project really taught me a lot. So one of my friends actually had gotten one of the first Macintoshes. We did all of our documentation on a 1984 <coughs> Mac with the 128K floppy. Um, and it was incredibly advanced at the time. Very slow, but incredibly advanced. And uh, that background really helped me because I wanted to build computers and I got a job two years out in Silicon Graphics. And so I spent the next 30 years in Silicon Valley. Now, uh, uh, Silicon Graphics, maybe before some of your guys' time, uh, it was the fastest 3D graphics uh, that you could buy. It was very expensive, but uh, it allowed me to work on building not just computers, but graphics computers. This computer here is actually refrigerator size. Um, it was one of the first, or the first, uh, risk processor multi, uh, multi CPU Unix machines. So we built uh, uh, multi processor Unix there. But more interesting to me was the graphics, which is what my team worked on. And we built the most, uh, you know, the fastest in the world. The last project we worked on, this one, this whole machine cost $250,000. Um, and we designed. Uh, 13 different chips for it, and uh, there were uh, 55 people working on it over two and a half years. So a very, very big, sort of wide project. I was responsible for most of the software and simulation for it. And what was interesting about this project, uh, you know, it, we made pixels, we made graphics, so we could point at things that people had seen. How many of you have seen Jurassic Park? Almost everybody is required viewing. Um, so back in the early 90s, uh, computer graphics were incredibly expensive. And this machine actually made them possible. This was the machine that the dinosaurs were designed and rendered on. And uh, in particular, one of these machines was actually in the movie when that little girl said, oh, this is Unix, I know this. She was talking about that computer. <laughs> uh, so I was able to point at things that I had done in movies and say, you know, I get to work on this, or at least help this get built. More specifically, I have to build a platform that other people use to make great things. So the software that created the graphics for Jurassic Park was actually built at, uh, at Lucasfilm, I think. Um, and you know, many people 
people picked our other build software on top of this platform to do geographic movie. But we also did, or they did flight simulation. We had many flight simulator companies move from very proprietary weird hardware onto a semi-standard uh, Unix operating system <coughs> that did well there. Um, computational fluid dynamics, uh, all sorts of uh, chemical simulation uh, were done on these machines. And one of the things that was done at this, in this last iteration called Infinite Reality was the ability to load a texture map that was larger effectively than all of memory. And it would manage all of the virtualization of the size of the texture. And so we did a demo where we zoomed in from a globe of this uh, low resolution planet, Earth, and zoomed in and you got closer and you would see the Matterhorn Mountain, which we had high resolution and 3D terrain for. And it would keep zooming in down to a 3D model of the Nintendo 64, which was also designed by somebody sitting next to us. Um, and then down to the MIPSAR 4000 chip, which was the first 64-bit processor at the time. So that infinite zoom capability inspired the flight simulator companies to adopt that machine. But it also inspired some of us to say, this is amazing. Wouldn't it be great if we could let everybody have this? But when a machine costs $250,000, not a lot of people can have it. So, just two years later, companies like 3DFX and NVIDIA were just getting started. And you could buy a three to $5,000 computer with a one to $2,000 graphics card that could barely do a tiny bit of 3D graphics. But with a lot of extra software, we made a startup that could do the same thing that I've done in that demo, but now make a, make a program and run on a PC. And so 1998, 99, we tried to raise money for that. Um, and realized it's too early because even though we could buy a computer like that, nobody had one of these, and so there was no installed base. So we waited. Um, well, we worked on a lot of things, but we kept trying. And in 2001, we raised money for this company called Keyhole, and we released this program. This was the very first version of the software uh, that allowed users to download a program for anywhere from $600 down to $129 a year and fly around whatever satellite data we had. Now, for consumers, the most important thing to do with download Google Earth is fly to your house. And if you do that, and you zoom in and it's a green blur, it's no fun. And we had that problem because satellite imagery was expensive and also hadn't even covered the whole world at that point. And so we did not have everything we needed. So 2001, we had some great demos. We could work in urban areas, perhaps some tourist areas. We focused on real estate in the cities where it worked and tried to not sell in cities where it did not work. But by 2004, well, 2003, we had our sort of watershed event, which was that uh, CNN had done a deal with us um, because uh, actually somebody I grew up with is now the CEO of CNN. And he had agreed to pay us to use Keyhole on air. And so in April of 2003, it had been in use sporadically uh, for a few months, but the US invaded Iraq. And suddenly, there was a lot of people who cared very much about where things, well, what things were going on in a place they did not know. And so CNN was using Keyhole to give context to all the aspects of the invasion and where US troops were going. And our Keyhole.com logo was on the screen all the time. This was great. A lot of interest, a lot of people downloaded it, many people saw the green blur, but we got more money and we were able to get more satellite imagery and improve that area. We also had to go buy disk drives at Fry's and install them in our server room and try and build up our infrastructure to just be able to handle the load. Um, and that was a whole challenge into itself. But by 2004, um, we had uh, piqued the interest of Google. Uh, Larry and Sergey were already interested. We came and talked to them and they basically decided to buy us in about 24 hours. It took about six months to close, but the, the deal was agreed to um, in 24 hours. And the reason we sold it to them, even though we were a startup, we might have an interesting play, was they had three things we did not. They had network bandwidth. They were already serving Google Search around the world and they could serve it very quickly. They had disk storage. They had this uh, GFS file system with large storage racks uh, already replicated in several data centers. And they had money. They helped us buy satellite imagery. They helped us buy aerial imagery. 
we were able to build up the Earth with better map data, better, better satellite, better terrain. And we launched Google Earth free in 2005, June 28th. So that first week was pretty much a success of that. So we nearly took down Google. We used more than half of the bandwidth of the company. And uh, <laughs> we had to do things like take the download of the program off the website and let just people who had it use it but not letting new users get on during the peak hours. And if you do the international peak hours, it turns out from about 10.30 a.m. to about 2 p.m. is when Europe is at dinner, the U.S. is at work, and Asia is waking up. And so that 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. peak is just brutal. So you take the download off, and uh, you figure out how to make things go faster. You sign some deals with the, uh, the uh, network uh, engineers at, at Google promising you're not going to use that much bandwidth anymore, and they let you uh, let you accelerate. So we did 100 million downloads in that first year um, of Google Earth. And, by, uh, and now, So we joined Google in 2004 with uh, 13 engineers, 29 people, and we joined a few others who were working on local search and a couple of people who had been hired to start working on maps. And so maps was a very interesting problem. So in 2000, MapQuest was a really cool mapping app. So before that, we had paper maps, and people were just amazed if you typed your number in here and your street and your type of street, your zip code and your city and everything else in five different boxes. You said go. In 20 seconds, you could get a digital map. That was great. And if you clicked on one of those arrows to go left, right, or zoom in, 20 seconds later, you would get another map. Now, in 2004, things hadn't changed much. It was still slow. And Google saw an opportunity to go faster. And one of the ways to do it is to re-render re the map, pre-render it for the entire uh, area. And so what they did is do that and cr cut a bunch of tiles and create this thing called Ajax, the original sort of JavaScript data model language where the application runs in the browser. So, so pre-fetching of tiles, making it fast. Google Maps was a revelation when it came out. People were just amazed at how fast it was because once you double click, you could zoom in instantly because the, the tiles were already there. They were very easy and didn't even have to wait for anything except maybe just fetching and because network bandwidth was so good, that too was fast. Now, it was popular, and people liked the speed, but uh, if you can read the bottom of this, you can see uh, this is a German screenshot, and Germany was unhappy with this map, as was really <laughs> how many people in the world. The dangers of launching early and often is sometimes you don't satisfy everybody just quite right. So Google basically had to very quickly like to use a lot more map data. We were using the same data as MapQuest. We were just pre-rendering it. So we were at the mercy of the map data providers, but we could make a better experience and also a better search experience for maps in those five boxes. Doing a single box search for either a business or an address uh, or a direction search was very powerful at the time. So those were the two advantages, speed and ease of use, but the map data was pretty much the same, which was to say, as we discovered, not very good. So I'll jump a bit and talk about Street View. This is the first Street View car, uh, truck, van, whatever it is. Two $250,000, um, and it was uh, you know, properly over-engineered, but it worked, and we were able to drive five cities and collect it and publish it in 2007. But we realized it wouldn't scale. It was too expensive to create a lot of these to cover the world. And so there was a crash project to find a cheaper way to do this and make some trade-offs to make, get down to a price point that we could scale. And the car you see on the left is the one you probably are familiar with. Some of you may have seen it driving around every now and then. And that car has now driven 40 million miles around the world. Uh, but the interesting thing is in the US in 2008, we drove 99% of the road. And we launched the United States Street View, and that was really cool. But what we learned was the map data is not very good. And there was nothing that proved this more is the you you're sitting there holding the map, maybe on your phone or on your computer, and you see that there's a mistake there. But we had pictures of the whole world. Not just street pictures, but aerial imagery and satellite imagery. So we decided to make our own maps and combine the data that we had together, figure out all of the differences on the different data sources, because each one of these data sources have mistakes. But you can actually 
uh, bundle adjust corrects the position of, they say, the local businesses or the imagery or the street view and correct them against each other and produce a much more accurate data as a result. We built a system called Ground Truth, which did that, but it also had a lot of human interaction to figure out things that were wrong. But the difference between the old way of making maps, where they would send two people out in a truck, one person taking notes and the other person driving, is now you can just have a bunch of people at their desk say, oh, this intersection is questionable. Let's go look at street view. Look around and say, oh, there's the street sign, or there's the address, there's the one-way indicator, and we would make the corrections on the map. And so we built the system to make much higher quality maps. We launched the US, Mexico, and UK in 2009 and continued on uh, working around the world. But one of the things that uh, you're probably familiar with is that the hardest thing to get right in Google Maps is the address of specific locations of your house or your business. Now, how many of you know what the address on your house looks like? Uh, a few of you. And how many of you know what your neighbor's address looks like? And does it look the same? Not always. In some cases, not at all. In particular, you know, say if the uh, number uh, looks like this, or worse, that one of those numbers is rusted, fell off, and left this brown spot that's in the shape of the number five. You know, humans can read that, and you can kind of navigate and be sure you're at the right house, but computers cannot. So we took a program that could uh, scrape all of Street View and find anything that looked like a one to five digit number and pull it out as a picture. We weren't sure if it was a number, but we would, would try. We ran all of these pictures through the best software we had, uh, OCR, optical character recognition, and got 35% right. So it's not bad, we'll take that 35% and that improved the map, but clearly there's a lot more we could do. So we took the rest of them and built a web service and, and put a lot of people in front of computers and said, here's a picture, type in the number. And we did that a lot and improved the map further, but we calculated it out and says, this doesn't scale. So we then took those same pictures and gave them to you. How many of you have been asked if you're a robot? That's right. And sometimes it'll ask you, here's two pictures, type in, type in what you see. One of those pictures, Google knows the answer to. And if you get it right, you're a human. The second one, we don't know the answer to, but you're telling us free data. So <laughs> that second picture is usually one of these numbers. And we would do this and send it to two different people. And if both humans agreed that this other picture had this number, we had a fact. So we had a picture and a number that was validated, and it didn't cost us anything. We did that two billion times. And that is why Google Maps addresses are as accurate as they are. Thank you very much. <laughs> so after that, um, in Google, in development, was this thing called Google Brain. You might now know it as TensorFlow, but in 2013, uh, Jeff Dean had built an internal system that I don't think we'd announced it yet. And uh, he had hired an intern, and the intern was looking around for interesting problems and found this data, talked to us, and said, well, can, can I use it? The intern took this data and applied uh, t uh, machine learning to it, and basically because we had two billion pictures and two billion right answers for what those numbers were, we were able to train a machine learning system that had 98% precision, 99% recall on those numbers, which means that they were more accurate than any two humans combined. So from a human perspective, we're done. We don't need uh, recapture, we don't need anybody to do this anymore. This particular problem is now solved. And you know, it's, it's a bit glossing over a bit that different countries had different styles of numbers and a few different rules, but all of that did get resolved. And so now this is entirely automated. Now there's a lot of other challenges with maps around signs and directions and changes and so forth, and not all of it is automated. And Google is working hard to automate as much as possible because the world is changing. And so even if you got it right once, uh, you have to keep working on it. So today, uh, Google has uh, reasonably accurate maps around the world. Uh, some of those countries were not done by Google, they were done by users who contributed data. Uh, in particular, North Korea is one where we certainly didn't drive street view, nobody exported any nice maps for us. So we had to do what we could by having users like trace satellite imagery and go look up road names that they could find 
would have people come out, North Koreans, who, you know, either visitors who went in or North Koreans who left, would finish out this map. And so we now have, as it turns out, if you read in the article in the paper this morning, better maps of North Korea are more usable than South Korea because uh, South Korea is the one country in the world that doesn't allow the export of map data. So Google can't use good map data of South Korea. So during the Olympics, people were complaining they couldn't get turn-by-turn -turn directions from Google in, uh, in South Korea, and yet you can get turn-by-turn -turn directions in North Korea. <laughs> Politics is a challenge. Um, so the challenge with maps is sometimes they're wrong, and I'm sure you've seen it where your address is wrong. In this particular case, uh, there was somebody noticed, uh, say, Nicaragua, that a border was drawn incorrectly on Google Maps between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. So this general took 24 troops and invaded Costa Rica, saying, this strip of land is mine, or ours. And for three weeks, he sat there, and uh, we, Google, had to go figure out how to correct the problem. It turns out the data we'd gotten was incorrect, and we did fix it. Um, and he was really using us as an excuse to make a point, but he did invade because of Google Maps, and when we fixed it, he pulled back. And this is good, because it turns out Costa Rica doesn't have a standing army, and this wouldn't have gone well from a, from a war perspective. So um, we did cause a very short invasion, um, and there are, there are bigger risks and more uh, controversial borders throughout the world. But the interesting thing about map data and sort of creating this platform is that the base maps help you get, around, get from here to there, get turn-by-turn -turn directions, um, but local businesses are built on top of that map data. Other stories can also be told on, on top of that uh, data. So in 2007, um, there was this serious problem in Darfur. There were you know, villages getting burned out, people getting killed. It was kind of a known problem, but the US had not gotten involved. A group got together and mapped all of the villages that had been burned out. And you could actually see this in the satellite imagery. We got recent satellite imagery. We saw these blackened out places where there used to be villages. And there were so many of them. They created this visualization on Google Earth. And George Bush came to the Holocaust Museum and was presented this demo. And the next day, he said that, yes, this is genocide. And the US got involved. So telling your stories your, with your data on top of a platform like Google Maps is the real application of map data, the ability to collect interesting data that is relevant to your mission. And there are many that have been done, but this was, I think, one of the, the most famous. So today, 3D graphics have gotten a lot easier. Uh, you can go to your Chrome browser or your Chrome book and uh, actually get almost all the functionality of the 3D uh, Google Earth in the web browser. That's pretty cool. Um, but things are going beyond that. Virtual reality turns out to be a really good application for the data that we created, this 3D model of the world. And the more accurate it is, the more stories you could tell within it. This first story is basically just Google Earth and virtual reality. But imagine as a platform, games or data or presentations using virtual reality with the real world as a backdrop and your data inserted in that. So I'm gonna take a bit of a jump here uh, and talk about Uber. In 2015, I left Google and went to Uber, and I worked on three things, really. I worked on their maps team, because it turns out they need maps more than Google did, because their business fundamentally depends on it. And I also worked on self-driving, as well as their business platform. So why did I do that, some people ask. And how many of you have taken an Uber? In this audience, yes, a lot of you have. So it's a two-sided marketplace. It takes advantage of the fact that cars are an extremely inefficient resource. Your car is parked 96% of the time. There are three parking spots for every car in the United States, deeply inefficient. So ride sharing says, I have an Uber driver who has a car, and he or she is sharing that car with you, and if they drive 20 or 30 hours a week, they've raised their utilization from 4% to 15 to 20%. So the costs come down, and you know, with the addition of Uber Pool, where a single driver can carry multiple people, which is happening in some of the bigger urban or denser urban cities, um, you're seeing that a single car can do a pickup, pickup, drop off, pickup, pickup, drop off, drop off, and be 
fully engaged for long periods, and so the costs go down even further. And there's a study in USA Today that says 25% of Americans today would be making a better fiscal decision not to own a car and just use Uber Cool for everything they do. So think about this. Cars are underutilized, and many of you, some of you, own cars that are not paying for themselves. It's, you have the convenience, but you, you, you could be saving money doing it the other way. And for a set of people, this is critical, a critical financial decision. So what is the next step in this? So, you know, I didn't fully answer it. The, the whole business of Uber, of personal transportation, is $5 trillion. And Uber is only 30 billion. So Uber has a lot of upside, you know, Uber plus Lyft plus Ola plus Didi and all of the rest of the ride-sharing services. There's a huge opportunity here to completely reshape personal transportation. But to do that, a few things need to happen. And I'm going to talk about one first before the other. So this is the, uh, one of the sort of interesting things I've learned in, in my last year at Uber was the application of machine learning and how easy it can be. So I'm not going to try and explain this block diagram. This was really the, just the best picture I could find as an example. But I can explain what uh, Uber does with machine learning. So for many years, uh, for several years before I got there, and even right when I started, uh, Uber was training ops people in each city to use SQL to do queries to figure out things about their drivers and their riders so they could make sort of piecemeal point decisions about how to, how to operate the business. This was, you know, SQL's a terrible interface. Um, and uh, they, but they did it, and they actually, you know, were able to tune their business as well as, well as they could. But it turns out that Uber's data is very clean in some ways. There are 1,500 inputs that describe a trip. There are like 30 outputs that describe the success failure of that trip, whether it's the star rating of the rider, the driver, whether the ETA matched the actual transport, things like that. So there's these success metrics, which are well labeled, and there's all of these inputs about um, what the trip was like, where, you know, how far away was the drive, rider and the driver, how many other cars were there, uh, how quickly was the pickup, um, and uh, you know, who, who is the uh, rider and driver, and what are their normal behaviors, and did they behave normally in this case? Um, so it's a great opportunity to apply machine learning because it's already pretty well structured. And so we built a system called Michelangelo. And uh, it allows a user who used to be, had to be taught SQL, to instead simply be presented with the user interface where all they had to do is effectively do feature selection, which is kind of what they were doing before. These are the criteria I'm interested in. Pick some. This is the thing I'm trying to optimize for, this result over here. And go take everybody in my geography on weekends um, and say, what can we do differently to make a better user experience? And so now it became a point and click. And so what happened under the covers was after you selected this data, Michelangelo actually had the implementation of basically every interesting open source machine learning library there is, from gradient decision boosted, tre gradient boosted decision trees and uh, deep learning. And it would let you automatically pick what it thought were the best potentials and then go run a set of jobs to analyze the results and then would show you, uh, did we find something meaningful that was going to improve it? And if it did, we will build an inference engine that you can just hand off to engineering and say, drop this into the system right here, and it will ma make a decision based on that learning system. So Michelangelo sort of automates the application of machine learning. And realize we didn't invent any machine learning here. We were just using best of breed public open source algorithms and built an infrastructure to apply it. And it's something I think that Cerner and others should and can do, and hopefully we'll have an open source version of Michelangelo itself, but the, the first version was very Uber specific, and getting that Uber specific glue out of it will take a while. But anyway, this was really cool, and what it taught me is how powerful machine learning is and how many opportunities there are to use it um, that people don't realize. And so I know some of your data is harder. You have a lot of natural language processing because a lot of your inputs are actually from doctors and nurses. And so figuring out how to turn that into specific inputs or specific outputs is a bit harder. But you have huge amounts of data, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for a system like this um, built at Cerner. So that was sort of one of my takeaways when talking to, uh, to the group on my last visit. 
So, you know, what other things can you do with machine learning? Well, self-driving cars have been worked on now for on the order of eight years, and now everybody's working on them, and they're actually achieving some success. Um, uh, this is a picture of Ubers, but you know, others are similar, and the idea is, instead of just uh, radar, which uh, some cars have, uh, we will put on a lot more sensors, uh, we'll put on LiDAR and cameras, and collect a lot of data and then try to get computers to make the right decisions about how to drive. And the challenges have been the sensors are expensive, the cars are cheaply looking, but the capabilities of software have gotten good enough now that Google in particular in Phoenix is now going to be driving without a safety driver, or is driving without a safety driver uh, with their self-driving cars. Now, the challenge for self-driving is that it's not a solved problem, and Google hasn't solved it. What they've done is they've picked Phoenix, which has very wide roads, and it's uh, very big, and it's very hot, so there are not a lot of pedestrians, and said, we can, <laughs> we, can, we can solve this problem here. And for the most part, during daylight, they have, but there are cases which do not work. You know, one is that uh, they cannot handle unprotected left turns. So if they have to make a left turn across traffic where some oncoming car could be speeding at 50 miles an hour in a 35 zone, they're not sure they can handle that, so they don't try. Um, if the sun is dropping below a traffic light and they can't see the red, green, blue, they can calculate, I know that when I hit this point and stop right here, the geometry of where the sun will be will be, make this thing unreadable, so I can't drive there. Um, and more, you know, more likely is what we saw out here in the last couple, uh, the last week or so, icy roads, hard to predict, you know, crazy drivers, all sorts of problems. They're not ready for that yet. So they have solved part of the problem. The advantage that ride sharing has is that in the cases where we know self-driving can work, send a self-driving car. In the cases where we know it cannot work, we offer a human. And now we have a service that is 100% coverage, and it's a mix of humans and automated driving. And I think that's how it's going to roll out. And I think that's why Uber and other self-driving, uh, other uh, ride-sharing companies are interested. And that's why Google is building a ride-sharing service. Um, because they realize that you're not going to buy a Ford or a GM that's 100% self-driving in the next five years. And in my opinion, based on the economics of cars, you may never do that. Um, you may just buy a service and it will be cheaper. You will save money over your current car ownership and over time will save a lot of lives. So this, you know, how does this connect with my 3D graphics? Well, it turns out that uh, the mapping of the world that we did with um, the aerial imagery and with uh, Google Maps, automated cars need even higher resolution 3D maps and they need to know exactly where they are down to one to five centimeters. GPS can't do that. And so you build up these models where cars localize where they sit in the world, and that's one of sort of the fundamental beginnings of, of self-driving cars. But once you build this 3D model of the world, what can you do with it that's even higher resolution than what we saw with the VR? So you can do this, and this is speculation. Uh, I guess I'm going on record since this will be a published video. Um, that, uh, you can apply a, a full 3D model world to augmented reality. So virtual reality covers your eyes, you can't see anything, you're living in a virtual world. It could be anything, it doesn't have to be correct, it just has to be consistent. Augmented reality is way harder. You can see the real world around you like this, and then data is drawn on top of it. And if you don't know exactly what the real world around you looks like, then you can't draw it accurately on top. So this is sort of the uh, over-canonical example of what you could do. If you had an accurate 3D model of the world and you were looking out at it, your glasses could then label everything about the world around you. And you see here probably an over-labeling over that will drive you crazy. But imagine that you were walking to a coffee shop that was around the corner to the left, and you weren't sure where you had to walk and whether you had to go in this entrance or that entrance. At some point, an accurate 3D model of the world will allow you to lay down that path and tell you exactly where to walk. And it will give you additional information about things nearby, but it'll draw in the context of the real world around you so it won't feel strange and it won't be as distracting as some like <coughs> email thing in your, uh, in your thing like Google Glass started with. So Google Glass was uh, you know, augmented reality version 0.1 and HoloLens from Microsoft is 
0.8, and 1.0 will still be something big and clunky, and it'll be kind of cool. But sometime soon, you'll be able to put on glasses like this and walk around the real world and get extra information about it. And I think that will be really cool. But to do it, you need this big 3D model. So this, to a degree, ties together sort of everything I have worked on, which is I believe that collecting the 3D model in the world was interesting. And you know, we're getting much better data. But at the end of the day, the consumers, you know, people with glasses will be the largest consumer of 3D data. And it will be easy enough to do it, probably in five to 10, maybe 15 years. And solving this problem of getting an accurate 3D model, I haven't even gone into what happens when you have tectonic plate shifts. Um, because there are inaccuracies sh simply by the fact that in California there are places where things are moving at a few centimeters a year. And you get, you know, you get edges in the road. And we, we, there's pictures in Google Maps where we've made mistakes because of problems like that. But when we get down to this level of accuracy, it's going to really matter. So mapping gets harder and harder the closer you get to reality. And then, of course, every map is wrong. There are always mistakes. The world is changing. How do you keep it updated? And I don't have an answer for that at this level yet. But uh, it's, it's fun. It's been a great, great ride. And uh, hopefully, I can answer some questions about it. Thank you very much. Anyone? Uh, so I realize this is a tech talk and not an economics talk, but you did mention, uh, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but it sounded like you were saying uh, ownership of self-driving cars may not happen in our lifetimes. Um, could you talk more about why you think that would be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you said ownership in our, in our lifetime. It's actually the reverse. Ownership may never happen um, is, is sort of what I've been playing. So the reason is that uh, in the short term, self-driving will not be 100% turnkey, in, in no pun, well, pun intended. Um, that uh, you can get in your car and it will handle every situation, every case. So Ford and GM won't be able to sell you a car that drives anywhere in every situation. But a Uber or a Lyft or a ride-sharing service that has an AV vehicle driving as part of its fleet can solve all your problems. If it works, they'll send an AV. If it doesn't, they'll send a human. If for some reason the AV runs into trouble, they'll send another car that's a, a human to go pick you up and make sure you get where you're going. And it's the services problem about why the car couldn't handle it. So the flexibility of not having to solve everything perfectly while still deploying safely is uh, very powerful. And so I think that you'll see cars go out like that. And the other part of this is simply ride sharing. A, if it's your car in the garage, it suffers the same problems I talked about before. 96% of the time, not utilized. And uh, three, you, know, you have to park it somewhere. And parking, it turns out to be really expensive. So one of the big changes that is going to happen is that ri as ride sharing takes over big cities, many of the restrictions on construction that require some number of parking spaces per 1,000 square feet, which limit what buildings we can build and actually put you guys out here um, because real estate for parking is, is affordable. Um, those limits will be gone, and we can actually change how cities are built, and we can return some fraction of parking garages and parking lots to green space or to residential or to whatever the city needs most. And I think that's, that's a pretty powerful change. But at the end of the day, I think that will be how the economics play out. And now, I can't speak to how Americans will feel about giving up their cars, and there may be some non-fiscally optimal decisions made around car ownership, and, and that, that I, I, I can't argue with, and I'm sure the marketing people in Ford and GM and everybody else will continue to debate that. So. Thank you. Yes, I can repeat. Go ahead. The question is, um, we, in the case where the sunlight's behind the traffic light, you know, a human suffers the same problem. They make the risky guess of assuming it's green based on other behaviors and hope for the best. Um, when do we know that these cars are safer than human? And so that gets into a lot of debate about numbers. So it turns out to uh, truly measure things, you have to drive 100 million miles without killing somebody 
to be better than humans in the United States. Uh, you have to drive 300,000 miles without injuring somebody, 100,000 miles without uh, having a police reported accident, and about 30,000 miles without a fender bender before you're better. And so the 100 million number is actually really hard. Nobody's come, we haven't, I think Google is now in the six or seven million range for their total number of miles. And theoretically, you'd have to do this all on one version of software to feel safe. So you can't really drive that far in the real world testing your software before you go live. It's just not financially reasonable. So what you do is you do a proxy and you say, no fender benders after 100,000 miles, are we three times better? And that's, that's partially flawed, but it's partially useful. You, know, you can say, yes, we're better, but we don't really know that we're not gonna miss that fatality risk accident, which is different. Um, so another thing that uh, Google does and others do is run simulations. So all that data that's been collected on all you know, n million miles that Google has driven and, and the n million miles that Uber has driven is collected and retained and new software every time it's created is put into simulation against all of the existing inputs for, and saying would the new software have behaved appropriately in every situation that the cars have seen so far. And so that adds uh, some, some number of miles of regression. But you can do even better because you can then take, here's all the situations we've seen, let's simulate a bunch of difficult, uh, <coughs> divergent uh, examples near the problematic ones and test all sorts of crazy tests and see how the software behaves. And you can actually throw a lot more at the software that way. Uh, and there's a couple of failure modes in self-driving software. One is around perception. Did I recognize it was a person versus a tree? A very important distinction. Um, and the other is around um, the uh, uh, planning, and did I make the right path and prediction? Did I predict, even though it was a person, did I predict their behavior correctly such that the path I chose was safe? And you know, so that second one turns out to be easier to simulate because you've removed 95% of the computational problem, which is perception, and now you just have this effectively 2D map of the world with its movers and its non-movers, and you say, what's the safest path? Let's create a bunch of situations. You can run many, many, many millions, and I've seen the word billions of miles uh, run in that method at, at Google. And so you simulate a lot. And so you create test cases and simulate, and you test your software. Every software release, you go through that testing. You also put it on the road and make sure it behaves, but you test it against everything that's ever been seen before. And this isn't proven, we're not done yet. Uh, you know, Google's just now getting, getting out there without a safety driver. So right now, I don't know how much I want to, safety drivers grab the wheel anytime the computer makes a mistake. And so anytime you grab the wheel, that's a black mark against the software, it, it made a mistake. And so you have to figure out um, why they took it and also see if the driver who took over made a mistake themselves. But you can do all of that sort of in a post-mortem and uh, analyze whether the software is working or not. And so reducing the number of takeovers is the metric that most people are using right now for quality. It's how many takeovers per 1,000 or 10,000, 100,000 miles. And in Google's case, I believe it's closer to the hundreds of thousands. Yes? So what are the cultural challenges about uh, self-driving in other countries uh, besides the U.S.? Yeah, so I think the, you know, some of it is the, the environment is different. Like in India with pedestrians and bicycles, it's scary. You know, I, you know it's that the computers, will, it, it's interesting, computers won't be dangerous, they'll be useless. They will sit there terrified and unable to move because all of their simulations say there is no way to get through there. <laughs> And so that's actually the problem with self-driving cars is they will become too conservative and uh, they will not move. And you will get angry at them because you could have walked there faster. Um, and so I think solving that problem will be part of it. Um, I, think, uh, I think the US has probably the biggest car culture that I know of. Um, the Chinese, for the most part, didn't have cars in the last 20 or 30 years and they will probably give them up, although they have the same problem with bicycles and pedestrians, but I think they have a more regimented uh, traffic uh, facility than in India. Um, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, all of Southeast Asia, the bicycles, the, the, go, the, the go bikes and 
so forth, those are also going to be a challenge. Um, we'll see. I think it will uh, go in um, the US and Europe, Japan, China, um, and Russia, and beyond that, uh, we'll see. Uh, but what, what, the, what all those countries will do is, you guys go first, <laughs> you know, you take the risks, and once we've seen it working, then we'll start to adopt it in our country. But it will probably require more software, better software, before it can make it in India, in, in my opinion. So, <coughs> yes? Mm -hmm. How do you connect them all together in a cohesive way? So we have all these layers of data. How do you connect them in a cohesive way? Um, w uh, there's both semantic and geographic. So geographically, they're theoretically all in the same coordinate system, although you sometimes have to move them into the same coordinate system. And once you do, then you can align them in that picture that I showed you earlier about the stack. Okay, way back here. Okay, too far back. This one. Um, where each one of these has mistakes on its own, right? You know, even satellite, even aerial imagery, you know, if you don't have the terrain part right, you end up drawing the buildings in the wrong place, they're shifted by a bit. The street view data is trying to locate itself based on GPS, but GPS is not very good, so they use imagery matching to match the pictures against each other as they drive around the loop and come back to the same intersection. There's a ton of work to make them accurate against themselves, but then you can align them against each other find out where the mistakes are and improve things. So in this case, uh, you know, this is how Google improved the quality, uh, the geometric quality of their data. Um, the semantic data where you have this local business that says it's in this building and the icon is not drawn in the building, you know, is sort of just a, a problem and you need uh, users to correct that. And you know, one of the things that you can do is with enough corrections and enough mistakes, you get into this you can do machine learning to discover styles of mistakes and apply that to all of your data and then pick out candidates and say, we're not really sure about this because it really seems like it's in that failure mode. And if you see Google Maps today, it's asking you a lot of questions. And there's a reason for that because they're really using your input as input to machine learning. So that's what I was saying. Yes, sir. Now, this is gonna sound kind of like uh, cost prohibitive, but I don't know if there's ever been talks or thoughts of starting to think about roads as like smart roads and embedding chips in roads mm -hmm. to think of like how you could read chips or read off of a chip on a road to say this is exactly where a car is and then report that back to some centralized system. So you could really monitor where every car is and make much, much smarter decisions. Now you'd have to like get in with the government and transit authorities and that's where it gets complicated. But I don't know if there's ever been any discussion or thoughts there, around that. There certainly has been discussion of sort of smart cities and instrumenting out roads. And I think the, uh, your, your answer was the moment you get involved with government, it goes slow. And technology like this moves fast. And uh, the software will get smarter faster than government can act. You know, I, I will say that in spite of my future career uh, attempt that I'm about to do. Um, <laughs> so, so by the way, I, I don't think I announced this, but I, I am running for Kansas Secretary of State. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But I think Kansas <laughs> needs better technology, and, and this is how I, I think I can help, help the state. So uh, I think that uh, the challenges with uh, making smart roads is really, it is cost, but it's also time. It, you know, if I'm going to build technology that depends on this embedding, then it has to be universal. And I think maybe the city of Singapore, which completely controls its environment and can push a button and spend $100 million, those guys might do it because they're autocratic and aggressive. Uh, but even China, who's autocratic, can't afford to do it for their country because it's too big. Maybe they could do it in one city and try it out. But I would say that you know, software will get smarter faster than even, even those methods. Other questions? Yes. That's right. Yeah. So how much of data is read on the other cars? Uh, so the question is how much data is read from the other cars that are driving with the self-driving car that perhaps could inform them about overcoming that sunlight behind the traffic light? And certainly as a human driver, yes, that's, that's what you do is you, you use the fact that uh, the driver to the left of you doesn't have this problem, they can see it, and they seem to be rolling. Now it could be that they're just oblivious and looking at their phone right now, <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to drive with them across an intersection that's red. Or the, the reason that you can't, you can't depend on that fact 
is that you won't have the car next to you. They might be 10 feet ahead of you and it was yellow and they were taking a risk, but they were okay and it's gone red and, and you would not succeed. Um, and so the challenge is that somebody having your identical decision process, even if they were 100% trustworthy, you can't really depend on. But these cars are taking into account the behavior of everybody else on the road. And they are looking at how those cars behave, trying to predict their path and making sure that they don't inter intersect. And so, you know, if you see a car quickly approaching an intersection, you actually get ready for some weird behavior because you know they might do something dangerous. These cars have to do the same thing. Otherwise, they won't be as good as humans, let alone better. Yes, sir. How many of these self-driving cars does there need to be for there to be a benefit for those of us who are not driving cars, that are, are, not, are not in a self-driving car? Mm -hmm. So how, how many self-driving cars do there need to be before it's a benefit? And, and the answer is in a service, uh, you know, on the order of 1,000 cars in a city, it, you know, active simultaneously is a huge impact on transportation in the city. And there are certainly talks of doing that. I think Google is buying hundreds of Chrysler minivans right now. Um, uh, and I don't know how, my understanding is they'll deploy within a year. So perhaps in Phoenix, you'll see that number achieved pretty quickly. Um, and so I think that you know, if it's part of a service where humans are driving as well, then you're, you're covered kind of no matter what. And you're covered even if the software goes down and you say self-driving is broken today, you know, humans will come in and, and cover. They'll probably charge more because they weren't planning to work today, um, but they will at least make the service available. Um, the danger uh, is that unless it's a reliable service, you're not gonna give up your car, right? One of the reasons not to do it is you can't always depend on a service that is flaky. So the goals of Uber and Lyft is to be ubiquitous and reliable so that you no longer question their presence and you can feel like you can give up your car. And in New York City, you know, transit was that, right? You know, many people in New York City don't own cars, they just depend on this reliable transit system or ignore the problems they're currently having with some of the subways that are about to break. But in general, you know, uh, Uber's mission statement is transportation is reliable as running water. And you know, there's a reason for that. You want people to trust it so much that they're willing to give up their car. Yes. I was just wondering, when you're talking about the rating uh, these systems and the evidence that's around this, that assumes we all agree on what is happening. So like with like ethics and these other things, we really assume that we have to all agree to like these systems. We don't really need to worry about this really kind of stuff. Right. So the question is with all these inputs and outputs in machine learning and selecting what is the, the right outcome. Are we selecting outcomes that are correct ethically and making, are we gonna make the right decisions? And I think this is probably the larger question of does machine learning bake in uh, societal unfortunate norms into its learned model? And I think that there, there is some risk of that and you know, there's a lot of uh, work right now in machine learning to figure out how to apply inputs and outputs in ways that invert some of the societal assumptions and see if it changes the output materially. And if it does, then yes, your machine learning model is not actually unbiased. It's you know, repeating biases in the human behavior and human decision processes that fed the inputs. I think that's a risk. Um, I think that uh, you know, for medical systems where you're, you know, you're trying to improve people's lives, I think that maybe there's an issue there, but I think that you'll do much better curing people and you may not do it perfectly but you're going in the right direction. And I would say for the most part right now, that's true. It'll be a while before I think we're baking in systems that uh, uh, are that kind of problem. And by that time, the systems themselves will be the data and they will probably slowly unbake it. That's my optimistic view of technology. I, I'll admit to that. Uh, any other questions? Way back there.
So when, when are these systems safe from hacking in the sense that he, the, he, the behavior of other cars around them could put them into a state where they could be attacked? Now, to a degree, you know, human behavior right now uh, says that you know, humans in cars tend not to mess with people in other cars uh, very often, and uh, it's, you know, police uh, correct it when it happens, but it's, it's relatively uncommon. There is a risk that an unoccupied uh, self-driving vehicle or, or a, you know, an occupied vehicle might be messed with more on the theory that it has to obey and can't itself threaten. And I, I do agree that's a problem, and I think that's something the society is just going to have to deal with. You bet. It should be illegal to mess with a self-driving car um, you know, uh, in, in a way that is uh, traffic-wise illegal itself because you're, you're interfering with traffic and you should get at a minimum a ticket and then a maximum maybe something a bit more. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard because um, I think there will be this transition point about how you behave around these self-driving vehicles. And you know, it's already happened. People have done this. They've seen, they've seen the, the Google or the Uber cars out there and they've you know, jumped into the street and seen if the car reacts. And it does. And it actually it reacts really fast um, because the software is faster and more aware than humans are in, in 90x percent of the cases. And that 9x, that 90x is actually the only debate, right? If it was 99.99, they would be all over the place right now. And at 98.7, they're not. So the goal is to get the number of nines of accuracy for perception and decision making for these computers so high that you can't argue with their presence on the road. Even if people mess with them, they'll be safer. Okay. One more, or you want to call? Uh, one more, if we have it. Otherwise, I think we're done. There it is. One more. Um, so, based on your experience, um, how long do you think um, will be before uh, we see uh, mass adoption of self-driving cars, if there's gonna ever be that day? And what are some of the top challenges um, today we're facing for self-driving cars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, I think as I said, the challenges are around uh, incomplete performance. There's things that self-driving can't handle. So I think that uh, ride-sharing services will integrate self-driving first. Uh, some you know, sort of aggressive numbers I like to say is that you'll see self-driving cars in downtown Kansas City within five years. And uh, my most aggressive one is that in 10 years, the majority of trips in downtown Kansas City will be by self-driving vehicle, not by owned car. And so. That's, that's aggressive, because Kansas City is, is one of the harder cities to drive in, both for ride sharing and for self-driving, because we have the most miles of road per capita of any major urban city in the United States. So we're big, you know, that, that loop of uh, 470, 435 is huge. So uh, I think it'll be a bit later there. It'll be sooner in Pittsburgh, it'll be sooner in Phoenix, more because they went first than anything else. Um, and I think over time, cities around the country and eventually cities around the world uh, will switch over. But my prediction, 10 years for a majority of urban trips in Kansas City being self-driving. Okay, with that, thank you very much.